This is topic 7.2 and we're looking at usability. So usability is defined and this is a vocabulary term that you would need to know. Uh, it is the extent to which a product can be used by specified users to achieve specific, their specified goals with effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction in a specified context of use. So basically it's, you know, does the product uh, achieve the goals that the user needs? Uh, is it effective in achieving those goals? Is it efficient? So is it easy and uh, without a lot of user error? And there's, is there satisfaction in that context of use? So in the environment in which it's meant to be used. Okay, so we're going to break down usability into a whole bunch of subtopics. So first things first, we want to look at something called ease of use. So ease of use is defined as, and this is a vocabulary term, um, it is defined as uh, novice users of a product should be able to learn the, its uh, basic features within one or two hours. So basically, somebody who is a complete and utter novice should be able to use uh, whatever product or service that you design within one or two hours. Okay, and you know here's an example right here of something that is very easy to use. Right, you can you know click here, buy with one click. You can buy uh, you know a book. Uh, this is from Amazon, so you can buy a book with one click, right? And boom, you're done. And so that, that's ease of use right there, right? Very easy to use. In fact, it, should, it takes much less than one hour to figure out how, how uh, um, to buy these products. And in fact, that's the thing about a lot of modern capitalism is that they, they make it very easy to spend your money. Okay. Now, what is easy, not easy? Now, we looked at this before. We looked at remote controls. So, you know, like, what are all these buttons here? What are these buttons here? Or, you know, okay, those are probably a keypad. Um, and comparing that to a more simplified um, remote control. So, you know, is, is something easy or not easy to use? Intuitive. So, this is a vocabulary term that you need to know. When something is intuitive, Using, using uh, so intuitive means using or based on what one feels to be true, even without conscious reasoning. It's instinctive. So, for instance, like you know this door right here, you don't even need the sign that says pull. You should be able to deduce just from the intuitive design of it that this is a door that needs to be pulled because it's got a pull handle, right? Even though it says pull, it should be very evident. It should be uh, based without even having to have conscious reasoning um, to, to figure out how to open this door, right? Even without the pull sign. Okay, mapping. Mapping relates to the correspondence between the layout of the controls and their required action. So actually a great um, example of that is, is like an Xbox controller, right? So these, you know, Xbox controllers, they are laid out in a way that, that fits your hands, um, they're, you know, that's perfect for, they're, they're easy to hold, you know, the design of these things was brilliant, whoever uh, first came up with this, this idea. It's, it's a real brilliant way to, to design a game controller, right? And it's very intuitive. I mean, it just fits in your hand. It fits perfectly in there. And so the, the layout of all the controls um, matches their required actions. Okay, visibility. So I'm going to use game controllers again for this one. So controls should have should be highly visible and be obvious how they work. So here's a game controller, and, and it's pretty obvious on how this works, right? You know, this moves you this way, this moves you, you know, moves you back and forth, the joystick here, and this is jump, right? Joystick moves you back and forth here, this is jump, right? You have a one player or two player. So it's, it's real easy to figure out what you're supposed to do there with the labeling, and, and probably this joystick only moves left and right. So then you absolutely know that that's what you should be doing. All right, it should have a low memory burden. So a user does not need to have have to memorize many features, how to use it, etc. So um, this is called low memory burden, where you just you don't have to memorize a whole bunch of things. Now this calculator, and um, I know you guys have used it, and, and you're you're good you know, good with it, but I want you to try to think back a long time ago when you were first uh, using a calculator like this. This does not have a low memory burden. There is a ton of things on here that you have to learn, and you have to learn them in just the right ways in order to use this effectively. So this has a high memory burden. So this is basically the opposite of a low memory burden. Now, there are better and nicer calculator layouts, um, but, you know, 
this is what we we're stuck with right here with with calculators so um, this would be again a high memory burden when we're designing what we want to try to do is have a low memory burden constraints so constraints are things that limit the way that a product can be used and I'm going to use some USB cables to, to demonstrate that so USB versus USB-C cable so this is a USB cable this is a uh, USB-C cable and this cable can only be used in certain configurations, right? Like you have to insert the the uh, USB cable here in the right way, or it won't go into the US uh, into the uh, um, the socket for it. And same with this. This this limits the way that you can actually put the cable into the socket. Whereas USB C cables are are symmetrical, and therefore they can go in either you know you can rotate them 180 degrees and they will go in the right way whereas this neither side of this cable can be rotated 180 degrees um, and work um, so this this has fewer constraints than this now you can't rotate this 90 degrees and expect it to work because it won't fit into the socket but you can flip it over and it will work so that's 180 degree rotation so this is more constrained and this is less constrained Alright, uh, uh, affordance. So affordance is the property of an object that indicates how it can be used. Like for instance, buttons afford pushing. You know that a button is for pushing. Um, knobs afford turning, right? You know that you're meant to turn a knob. So that's called affordance. Learnability. So this is the extent to which a user can operate a product or system at a defined level of competence after a predetermined period of training. So how easy is something to learn? Um, if we go back to that calculator example, it probably took you quite a long time to figure out how to use a lot of the functions on the calculator. Um, what, what is our um, you know, length of time that we want to, to give you to learn how to use that calculator properly? Or if you think of something like uh, Fusion 360, Fusion 360 has, you know, it's, it, t it takes a lot to learn it. You have to put a lot of time in there. So we have to decide what competence we want you to, to have with any particular system and how long that training should last. Okay, attitude. So attitude is the perception, feelings, and opinions about a product user. So, you know, when somebody has an attitude, you know, the attitude that, that someone holds about a particular product. So that's their perceptions of how they perceive it, which means how they feel about it and their opinions about it. So that is defined as attitude. These are all, these last few things are all vocabulary words that you need to know. <laughs> so make sure you write those down. Okay, we move on to efficiency of use. This is also a, a vocabulary word. Make sure you know it. So, you know, basically I'm going to define this as, you know, how many clicks does it take? Well, actually, this is not a vocabulary term, sorry. But how many clicks does it take to get the stuff you want to know? How many menus must you navigate? Our website is pretty difficult to tell you the truth. Like if you want to get to, you know, what am I studying in design in grade uh, or design technology in grade 11, you've got to go to learning and then you've got to go to DP and then you've got to go to group four or I don't know. You have to go through several menus just to get to where you need to be. And this is actually very difficult. Um, you know, you can design things that, that take fewer clicks to get places. And then we also need to pay attention to something called digital literacy. And digital liter literacy is literally like how do you navigate things like screens? And we want to make things, depending on what, um, you know, what the context is, we want to make things easy for people to, to navigate. Okay, effectiveness is a measure of the speed of performance or error rate and its relation to the capabilities of a product. So I'm going to use the example of, of a QWERTY keyboard. Now, if you're, if you're wondering, why is the keyboard laid out this way? Well, it's laid out this way because of typewriters. So the person who created, and I don't know their name, I apologize, the person who created the QWERTY keyboard, and it's called a QWERTY keyboard because of Q-W-E-R-T-Y, right? There's the QWERTY right there. Um, the reason that, that it's laid out that way is that these keys on a typewriter back, back way back when, um, if they weren't, you know, if, if they were pushed in a particular order, they could stick together. So if you push too many keys or if you push keys too quick, what would end up happening is the, the keys would stick together and, and then the typewriter wouldn't work anymore. So 
basically the QWERTY keyboard was created to actually slow people down a little bit, so actually slow down the speed, but to decrease error because when the keys got stuck together then you had an error and you had to stop and fix it and it took time away from that. So the QWERTY keyboard was actually invented to, to uh, increase performance, not by increasing speed, but by, by uh, reducing error rate. Now we still have this today, and, and the QWERTY keyboard is, is you know, probably not necessary today because you don't have the same problem with these keys that are hitting, I don't know if you've ever seen a typewriter working, but there's keys here. When you push one of these um, letters, it will poof, it'll strike, uh, like a little hammer will come up and strike the, uh, the um, the ink ribbon and then and put a letter on the paper. Well, we don't have to do that with a with a modern keyboard. And in fact, there are lots of designs which are not QWERTY, QWERTY keyboards, but these are now standard, so people use them because of that. But uh, yeah, so effectiveness is talking about performance and and error rate. All right, when we are designing things, we need to give clear, unambiguous feedback. Like for instance, when I know that this power strip is on because the red LED light right here is on. Here, I don't know whether these, just from looking, I cannot tell whether the lights are on or off, right? They're, they could be either because I can't tell because of the, the um, there's no uh, feedback given. There's no clear, un ambiguous feedback. I'd have to actually look up at the lights. And to tell you the truth, in the morning when the, when the sunlight's streaming in, uh, to the design hub because these are in the design hub um, you can't tell like it's it's actually quite difficult to tell if the lights are on or off so that's uh, you know that the, there's no feedback here now on the exhaust fan there's feedback right like when you when you click the switch we see a red line here which tells us that that exhaust fan is on now the, it's not so it's it's got feedback but it's not as unambiguous in the sense that does the red, when you see the red, does that mean that the, the exhaust fan is on or off? This is very clear and unambiguous, right? You know that this power strip is on. Here, you've gotten feedback, and if you learn, oh, okay, when, when, the, when the red part is, uh, when you see the red part, then it, we know that it's on. Um, then you know, but it's not clear enough, it's not unambiguous, like you have to actually learn whether that, that feedback uh, is telling you that the, the thing is on or off. Okay, we need to have clear human interfaces. And so uh, a, a human uh, an interface, a human interface is the point where humans and machines interact. And I want you to understand that the, the root word inter means between. So example, international, right? If I look at international, it means between nations, right? So um, yeah, when you are working with a machine, you should have clear human interface. There should be no doubt about what you're doing. It should be very, very clear and, and uh, understandable. So here's some examples, right? You know, this is a, a clear human interface. You know, if I want to select something on a, a mobile mobile device, I just have to click on it. I can I can expand or I can contract, right? I can so make make things bigger and smaller. Whereas this is very, you know, this is a, a good clear human interface. This super confusing. Don't know what's going on here. How many buttons are there? What do these things mean? You know, like yeah, it's just a mess, right? So this is a, a, an example of a, a poorly done human interface, and this is an example of a, a well done human interface. Okay, user error. So user error is, are the mistakes and slips when when using the product due to aspects such as complexity or inefficiency. So user error is where we are looking at. Well, how do people, you know what mistakes are they making, right? Um, is it possible for them to to not make those mistakes? So, you know, when we're looking at this, uh, it's just a little joke, you know, push any key, but, you know, where's the any key? So that's called the user error. All right, enhanced usability benefits from, uh, so benefits from advanced user, usability. So enhanced usability means that you're, you've done a good job with the usability, that it is a very usable product. So, you know, it avoids, uh, sorry, it improves product acceptance, it improves user experience, it improves productivity, it reduces user error, and reduces the need for training and support. So we can design that into our um, designs. So we want good usability as we are um, thinking about our designs. Okay, 
the last sort of topic I'm going to talk about are population stereotypes. And this fits in with usability because you have to pay attention to uh, culture and people who are, you know, the people who are actually using your products. So a population stereotype is when we, ca it's a categorization of populations based on culture, class, gender, etc. Create, you know, and it, it creates assumptions and associations on how a population may approach a given situation, right? So we think we know how somebody's going to approach a situation based on, on their culture, their class, their gender. We, we, we have sort of a, a, um, an algorithm, I suppose. So like a, a standard way that we, we think that a person will react. Now, there's huge problems. And stereotypes uh, influence dress, uh, use of products, aesthetics, values, and so on. Okay, And this is all to some extent, right? So this is something that we need to be careful of. Because um, population stereotypes, they're, they're good. They're a useful shorthand of how things are going to work. Right, it's, it's it's useful to know that, like in general, this group of people is going to act in this way, right? It's 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 kind of useful for that. Um, you know, just a, a quick aside on that. Like for instance, in China, uh, you don't write somebody's name in red because that's you do that when somebody is is uh, is dead. So you're not going to write somebody's name uh, in red. Uh, the number four in China is bad luck because it sounds like the word for death. So again, people don't use the number four for things. Um, it's not a popular number. Okay. Now, now the number eight is very popular and it's a very uh, um, auspicious kind of um, number. So you might use eights instead of fours when you're designing things uh, for, for a Chinese population. But that's not always going to hold true for everybody, right? And this is the problem with stereotypes is that you're, you know, you're sort of you're looking at an entire population and saying, I'm going to be, you know, designating these, these people in this way, and, and they may not be that way. So it, it is, it can be problematic. So be careful with your stereotypes. You should be using stereotypes to help you and help guide, uh, in a general sense, um, your understanding of a population, but you shouldn't uh, depend on them solely you need to do some research to find out some more information about about them so be careful with population stereotypes okay and that's it for today